Good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here for the last installment in our webcast series on dermatology, what to do about ear problems in shelter and foster home dogs. I'm Lynn Fridley, Program Manager for Maddie's Institute. Our speaker is Dr. Karen Moriello, Clinical Professor of Veterinary Dermatology at the School of Veterinary Medicine, University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she's been on the faculty since 1986 and is widely recognized as an expert in the field. Before we start, let's talk about a few housekeeping items. Please take a look at the left side of your screen where you'll see a Q&A window. That's where you'll ask questions during the presentation, but don't hold them until the end. Questions asked in the last few minutes will probably not be processed in time for a response. If you need help with your connection during the presentation, you can click the Help widget at the bottom of your screen. The green file widget contains the presentation handout, evaluation survey, and a printable certificate of attendance for people attending this live event. So be sure to download and save and print. Dr. Moriello, thanks for being here with us tonight. Um, thank you. Um for inviting me, and I'd like to thank Maddie's Fund for hosting the seminars. Um, it's really great, and I do enjoy sharing information uh, about skin diseases, particularly um, important skin diseases that occur in shelters. So tonight's um, presentation um, is going to be focusing on ear diseases, or otitis, in dogs, and its management in shelters and foster homes. And this is one particular disease where much of what is done um, in the triage stage uh, in private practice with private pets is very applicable uh, to both the rescue organizations um, and, and shelters in general. Uh, I, this is an ear and it looks angry and this is a classic ear of otitis. Everyone who has ever you know, taken care of a dog has seen this type of problem uh, in one shape or another, sometimes less severe, sometimes more severe. But it's a huge problem, and it's probably one of the most common in veterinary dermatology. So the clinical picture of otitis um, is it's important to know it can happen in any age, breed, or sex of dog. It is more common in the warmer weather. So if that's been your impression, you're absolutely right. And it's the little ears act like tiny little incubators. Uh, it is more common in dogs with poor husbandry, mainly because there's going to be more moisture, more crowding of infectious and contagious diseases, um, and less just routine care. Some dogs just need a little bit of routine care um, with their coats. There's conformational risk factors. Um, probably the hallmark uh, breed for that would be the Sharpe. They're sort of born with very uh, closed and narrowed ear canals, um, but there are definitely other breeds that have problems. Uh, pendulous ears are one. Hair in the ear canal can be an issue. Narrow dual canal, as I mentioned, Sharpe's. And then there's all, very importantly, breed risk. Um, breeds that are at high risk of allergic diseases or hornification defects, such as dogs with subria, are ones that are predisposed to ear disease. As far as the clinical signs, it's what you would expect. Shaking and rubbing of the ears. Shaking and rubbing of the ears, um, shaking the head. Um, sort of an odd carriage to the ears, uh, to the head. The dog may be um, holding his head to the side or there may be a head tilt. Odor is probably the one that um, I hear about the most. The dog just stinks and I picked up the ears and it's horrible. But there may be blood um, or exudate. Um, sometimes the first signs is you just, the dog shakes his head and you know your house looks like a crime scene because there's just so much blood everywhere from whatever's causing the problem. And then there's something called oral hematomas, or these are um, when a dog will get bleeding between the two ear canal, uh, between the, the flaps of the ear, and you'll get this swelling. Uh, painful ears and any behaviors with that. Dogs that are head shy are oftentimes dogs that have had a lot of ear disease. Um, or if a dog that's normally very, very nice suddenly you know, reacts a little bit more um, defensively to being petted, the ears may actually be one of the problems. Okay. So it is important to have just a little bit of information about the anatomy of a dog ear because it makes it easier to understand the diseases and um, basically, you know, when people are, are talking about cleaning, you know, 
and where the eardrum is, so you have an idea what is um, where, where everything is. So this is a plastic model, and this is sort of a um, cross section of a dog's ear. The pinna, everyone recognizes it. That's the ear flap, and then the vertical canal. Uh, that's the canal that goes up and down. So if you think of the ears like pipes underneath your sink, the canal that's uh, vertical going up and down, that's the same canal that um, a vertical canal. That's what veterinarians look in. And then the horizontal canal where um, the pipe starts going back into the wall. And again, in order to see down there, you need an otoscope. And then where the pipes would go behind um, the wall, um, that would be um, representative of the tympanic membrane or the eardrum. And so you can pretty much kind of look down there until you see things, and you can't see anything behind the wall. So what's behind the wall? What's behind the eardrum? Well, the big space there is the bulla or the middle ear, and that's where a lot of disease gets uh, sequestered. And then also um, in the ear or behind the wall are the, um, the organs of hearing and balance. So this might be like the equivalent of your electrical um, equipment or some other tubing. So that's kind of how I explain it to uh, to clients and to owners who are um, going to be managing dogs, and it does it does help a lot because it does kind of give you a feel for um, the anatomy in a more practical sense. Now, in order to have otitis, you really need a recipe. You just have to have all the right things happen at the right time. And this is a dog with otitis, and it's almost impossible here to see the orientation because the ear has is just so proliferative. There's all those lumpy bumps all over it and red, um, but trust me, it's an ear. All right, so inflammation is the first one. You need to have something that causes an increase in secretions in the ears. The ears are just an extension of the skin, and they have their own oil and um, cell um, exudates that secrete into the ears. Um, the inflammation will cause the ear canals to get narrow or stenose. So if you're going back to the anatomy um, using the pipes under the sink is sort of a, an analogy. Things can line on the inside of the pipe, making it narrower and narrower and narrower until eventually it clogs up. Uh, it also, inflammation causes an increase in the temperature of the ear, which favors the growth of bacteria. And then you can have a change in the surface of the uh, ear canal and, and the environment. It can become ulcered or it can become roughened, and all of those things uh, can make it much easier for the disease to be perpetuated. Now, a major factor in ear disease is narrowing or stenosis. This will trap the secretions. It prevents the normal ear canal cleaning. Uh, the ear actually kind of has a little mechanism by which it actually cleans itself out. Material comes down um, the, um, the, the tympanic membrane and then sort of just gently moves out uh, and gets uh, emptied out of the ear canal, kind of like a little escalator. And that all stops and shuts down, so everything just sort of plugs up. Uh, it causes humidity in the ear, inflammation leads to more stenosis, leads to more inflammation and more stenosis, and this becomes a vicious cycle. It's a major cause of pain because the ear canal, what's holding that canal and giving it shape is cartilage, and it doesn't stretch. It, can only, it, it has a limited amount of um, plasticity to it, and once it is fully extended and you have more and more pressure on there, you get tremendous amount of pain, not unlike having a headache where you have you know, your cranium, which holds things in place. Uh, also, if it's stenotic, you can't get medications into the target area, which is the ear canal. So basically, you might as well be putting the eardrops on the dog's nose for all that it's doing. And the stenosis can be temporary, but if you leave it unattended, the ear can become fibrotic, kind of thickened, or even calcified like bone. Okay, the next thing you need is microorganisms. Bacteria alone don't cause an infection. Dog has a healthy ear, doesn't have inflammation, doesn't have stenosis, and you put contents of a Petri dish in there, no problem, it's not gonna do anything. You need concurrent clinical science. You need the other things to be present. Now the normal flora is what starts to overgrow. Mainly staph, some strep, and yeast. They're present there normally, but once the environment becomes more hospitable to them, they take over. Bacteria in association um, with clinical signs, um, you will see that. So if you do a, a swab, you see all these things, and the ear's inflamed, it's important. Rods are one of the organisms that we worry about the most. Um, so if you are thinking about the um, bacteria, bacteria are like little round M&Ms, and rods might be like little um, good and plenty candies, that kind of a shape. And probably the most problematic is one called Pseudomonas. 
uh, because that one is associated with a lot of very severe ear disease. Um, and you can have yeast and cocci. And these are just two slides showing bacteria. On the left are yeast, and on the right are, is a full fields of rods and cocci. So when you get into a dog with ear disease, the question always is, is what do I do first? Where do I spend my money? What's the most cost-effective thing? And that simply is an ear swap cytology. Because with that, you can go ahead and start moving toward you know, making treatment decisions for your patient your pet or your, your guest. So the first thing is, is um, make a slide for staining. I just roll it out like you would do. And also do a slide in mineral oil because you were looking for uh, Demodex and Otodectes. Everyone's very familiar with looking for Otodectes when we have you know, a juvenile patient, a pediatric patient. Um, but sometimes you'll find it in adults. But very importantly, a lot of dogs with chronic skin disease and chronic otitis will have Demodex in their ears and Demodex on their body, and you can, you can often find it that way. Now, some rules of thumb for cytology, and that's just a nice little swab there with a big puddle of pus on it. Um, it is the core diagnostic for ear disease. Always get it before you do anything else with the ear cleaning it. If you think you're going to do ear culture, get one right away before cleaning it. You want to always look at the findings in light of whether or not there's clinical signs. So if the dog doesn't have any ear problems, doesn't have any clinical signs, and you do an ear swab and you find bacterial organisms, they're living in peace with the ear, and they're not clinically important. However, if the dog is having problems, then it becomes clinically important. So you always need to have abnormal findings in the presence of disease. And what that does is it tells you what your action plan is going to be. Now, this is um, a slide, and it kind of looks like um, balloons or bubbles, and what this is is actually typical debris from a dirty ear, just a dog that has got a lot of ceruminous debris in the ear, and this is just what cerumen looks like in the ear wax when you stain it. It doesn't really stain very much. The little bit of blue there are epithelial cells, and this is normal, and you can dogs sometimes can have a lot of this, and there's no problem with it, but you need to be able to recognize that part. Okay, so cytological specimens. So what do you do when you have a cytological specimen? Well, the first thing is, is you know, the first one I just showed you wasn't very cellular. You didn't see very many organisms. Um, it was very pale and not staining. But if you do see cellular samples and you see white blood cells or neutrophils, you need to assume that there's an infection. It might be deep in the ear or it may just be very in the very distal part, very superficial, but it's there. You need to remember that you can have a really bad infection without a lot of organisms there. If there's inflammation, stenosis, and pain, and you see organisms there, but you're thinking, well, you know, I should really see a lot more for as severe as it, as it is, just remember, that doesn't necessarily reflect it. You don't know what happened to the, your dog before it came in. You don't know if someone cleaned the ears. And you also don't know if the infection might actually be deeper in the ear. And so the few that you, organisms that you see out in the external ear canal aren't very helpful. Uh, cocci, if you just see cocci and yeast only, um, you might be have a dog with allergic disease or primary seborrhea. So those are some things to think about, particularly if you only see cocci and yeast with no white blood cells. You get a lot of overgrowth of those two organisms in dogs with allergic or bacterial disease. In the worst case scenario, you can run into a rod. Okay, so as far as the sizes go, it does help to be able to recognize these on site. And malassezia or yeast are really big. If, um, if anybody can remember the circus peanuts the, um, the, that you get in the, in the um, chewy pink ones that you know they're kind of made of uh, candy, um, the big peanuts like that, those are malassezia sizes. Now, cocci would be about the size of, like I said before, M&Ms and rods, like good and plenty. So yeast are really, really big. And rods and cocci are, are much, much smaller. And in the sample on the slide on the right, you can see down in the bottom, right about um, the 6 o'clock, you can see some big um, organisms, and those are yeast. The smaller little dots are cocci. So you can see how different they are in size. Now, another thing you're looking for is whether or not the, there are bacteria present. And you can find them in cells, like on the right-hand side. You can see where there's white space. You can see there's, there's blue dots there, and those are cocci. Or you can find them extracellularly. Either way, they're important when you see them in the presence of neutrophils. And it indicates that you have um, a situation on 
uh, that probably is going to need a culture if the animal's had any history of ear disease before. Now, another thing you can see that helps you determine that there's a problem is what's called nuclear streaming. And that's all that, if you see all those like lines and waves that are present there, when you make a slide, you roll out material and you essentially smash it onto the cell, onto the slide, and it damages it. And so it causes the cells to kind of just stream out um, and you know, drag their debris across the um, surface of the cell. And so you may not see intact white blood cells. But if you see that kind of streaming like that and those lines, that indicates that it's nuclear streaming and that there is infection present and inflammation. Okay, so with that information, you have to have a plan. And so, you know, when you're dealing with otitis, you have to make some decisions pretty quickly because these diseases are painful uh, and um, very uncomfortable for the dog and they're odorous and they have a lot of, you know, you can sometimes have windows by which to solve a problem. So, otitis triage. The first thing you're looking for, obviously, everyone's looking for, is there trauma. It could, what you have for ear may just simply be bite wound, it might have been frostbite, um, any kind of trauma. And that goes down to, you know, work that into your trauma situation. Um, then if there is no evidence of trauma, what you're looking for are clinical signs. Is this acute? Did it just happen? Because ear diseases can really flare up in overnight in four to six hours, because if it's acute, it might be acute and curable, um, such as otodectes or just a dog that gets swimmer's ear. Or is it a complicated problem? And that means that this problem has been going on for a long time, and how might you tell that? You might see signs of other uh, skin disease in the dog. Maybe the ears are very thickened. Maybe there's very, a lot of pigmentation on the ears. Maybe the dog has been licking feet, and you see a lot of you know, salivary staining, as we talked about in the allergy module, um, or the dog has got a matted coat with a lot of hair loss. Anything that suggests that there's other problems indicates that that might be more of a chronic problem. And then the other thing you're looking for is, does the dog clearly have end-stage ears? So what is an end-stage ear? An end-stage ear is an ear where there has been so much chronic damage that it's not likely or that you are going to be able to manage the problem medically. Or does your patient need, or your, your dog need immediate surgery, such as this dog with an oral hematoma? So that's what you're looking for. Trauma, did this come acutely? Do I have a dog with lots of skin disease and ears? Well, that's complicated, and that falls into, you know, any, like, usually allergy or cretinization disorder. Um, do I have a dog that maybe I need to talk about um, in surgery immediately um, because it's got an oral hematoma? Or do I have ears that we really need to talk about might need some very drastic surgery, such as a total ear canal ablation. Well, we have our first poll question, Dr. Moriello, um, and this is for you in the audience. So you can join in the conversation by answering this poll question directly on your screen. How often can you do otoscopic examinations on dogs at intake? Always? Almost always. Visual exam only? Not part of the normal intake exam, never because we lack equipment, don't know or not applicable. Please answer on the screen. Oops, I really didn't want to do that yet. Um, please answer on the screen, and we'll go to the results in just a second. How often can you do autoscopic examinations on dogs at intake? I'd like to remind the audience also to... Uh, uh, Get your questions in for Dr. Moriello, um, and you do that in the question and answer uh, box on the left-hand side of your screen, and please get them in early. We'll take the questions at the end of the presentation, but don't wait until the end. Get them in as soon as you can. So let's look at the results. Oh, well, that's pretty interesting, Dr. Moriello. What do you think of that? Yeah. Well... The people who are, who are answering always or almost always um, obviously have equipment and um, obviously have had experience with doing otoscopic exams. Um, visual exams only are not necessarily um, an incorrect thing to do uh, because if the ear looks good, then there's no reason to go ahead and try to examine the dog, um, you know, especially if you're limited on time. Now, when we're looking at patients with dermatology problems and the ears are painful, we 
actually don't even try to do an otoscopic exam on an awake dog. And then not part of the normal intake exam, I might just suggest peeking at the ears because if there's odor or a dog is painful or somewhat difficult to handle, that might be part of the problem. But it's sort of a general mix across the board and usually rest, rep, um, uh, just reflects um, you know, what the resources are. Now, otoscopic exam, as I said, do it if you can. In dogs that are very painful, this may not be possible. Uh, and definitely, if it's going to put you at risk or any of your um, staff at risk, then you need, you need to remember that you need really good restraint with this. And probably no ear exam is better than anybody getting hurt or getting bit or the dog getting injured. Because if you cause a lot of pain at the time you're doing an otoscopic exam, that will make that dog, it will contribute to that dog's um, head shyness and actually kind of fear of being uh, handled by veterinarians. When I have dogs that are difficult to handle and they're kind of head shy, sometimes I'll just ask, Do you, have you been cleaning his ears since he's been little? And you'll get yes. And I'm like, well, okay, well, maybe that explains to me why we're having trouble looking at, at, at the dog. Okay, so let's talk about what do you do with uncomplicated um, otitis. And this is a situation where you look, do an exam, either visually or with an otoscope, and you see that there's a problem in the ears. Okay, and uncomplicated otitis is like a simple infection. There's no other clinical signs present. It sort of indicates or suggests um, that it might be treatable and curable. When might this occur? In young dogs, particularly with ear mites. It might be common in warm, humid weather. Um, the ears may be painful, but they palpate normally. The ears should be very easily collapsible. It shouldn't take any difficulty to, to collapse them. Um, if you can't remember how easily a dog's ear should collapse, just go cuddle the next puppy that you can get your hands on, and that's how it should be. Um, you might see just redness and exudate on the ear, but no signs of chronic changes, so the ear um, epithelium looks smooth. It's just red. And these are dogs that respond to conservative treatment with ear cleanings and topical otic um, ointments. There's some breeds of dogs that we don't know why, but I see very commonly um, beagles and basset hounds as sort of just pediatric patients. They'll have one really bad episode um, of otitis as, as a puppy and it's yeast. I don't know if it has to do with the, usually the dogs are just newly acquired, newly adopted. Um, I don't know if it has to do with the stress or not. But, you know, that also happens just because a, a dog that is, of a breed that's predisposed to ear disease or skin disease has a problem. As a young dog, doesn't necessarily mean that's going to be the um, going to be the the what happens all the time. So, Lynn, and back here's on. the next the, the yeah the next uh, poll question for the audience. Uh, please again answer on your screen. Uh, what do you do when you see hair in the ear canal of a poodle? Do you pluck it? Clip it? Do nothing? Don't know? or not applicable. What do you do when you see hair in the ear canal of a poodle? So answer on your screen, and after you've done that, I'd like to remind you to get your question, questions in for Dr. Mor Moriello. Do that in the question answer box on the left-hand side of your screen, and we'll go to the results. All right. I like these results. Okay. Okay. So, some, some people pluck it. Uh, some people clip it. Um, and a lot of people don't do anything. Um, and so let's talk about ear uh, hair in the ear canals. Of not, Poodles are sort of our poster child for it, uh, but um, I've got some suggestions that might be helpful. So with regard to poodles, there is something that I have noticed over my many, many years of being a dermatologist is that standard poodles, oftentimes they come, they come to me with chronic ear problems, will have um, one ear canal that is, congenitally narrowed. Um, the, when you do our di visual diagnostics, um, it seems narrower. When we do imaging with like radiographs or with a CT, one ear canal is just wide open, just huge like the Mississippi, and the other one is just narrow like a stream, and there'll be no inflammation there. And so they're sort of born predisposed to having problems. And those kind of dogs are dogs that can benefit from certain types of surgery, such as a lateral ear resection. Um, and they're definitely ones where hair in the ear is going to be a problem. And so it might be beneficial to remove it. Now, hair um, in the external ear canal actually serves a purpose. 
Um, as we all know, it's there to prevent foreign material from getting in there, particularly on the mat, and it's supposed to be there. Um, some things that are important to note is that the hair roots can can be very, very long and almost sometimes the seen to you can see the you can see a hair and you pluck it and it looks like the hair root comes from behind the tympanic membrane. So you think you're just plucking the hair from the ear, but if you're really getting in there with your hemostats and plucking hair, you might be plucking it from very, very close to the eardrum. Uh, plucking of hairs is a very common cause of dogs with otitis media, especially in dogs where it's been started really young and it's going on all the time. And there's no history of skin disease, no history of ear disease. It's just what we've always done with our dogs for the last however. And dogs will come in once we stop that. Um, we then go ahead and can resolve the otitis. But as long um, as the, the plucking, which is causing microtrauma, goes on, it can be a problem. And then another thing is, is we can have hairs um, sort of ringing all along the um, tympanic membrane. So what you're looking at in the picture there um, is the white uh, thing at in the probably about 1 to 2 o'clock, uh, that right there is a small catheter. All those little black lines are tiny little hairs down by the tympanic membrane, so small you can't get them. And sometimes they tickle the dog's ears, but the point of showing this is to show you how far down those hairs go. So you need to be really careful and have a really good reason to remove the hairs of, from any dog's ear. Um, you know, obviously, if they have problems and they've got otitis, you may need to do that in order to clean the ear properly, remove all the pus and debris, and then eventually go ahead and, and successfully treat the ear. Um, it is, you know, if the dogs don't have ear problems, but the hair in the ears does is problematic, I might suggest just clipping it. And what I really like to use are those little tiny miniature clippers that you can stick up into your nose to clip nasal hairs. Uh, they work really, really well because you can just clip the hairs really short and then you don't get a lot of that um, exudate and smelly, waxy debris building up on the ears. If ears need to be plucked for any reason, it's just standard or, or it's just something you really feel strongly about, it's really important, not do it if the dog has um, a tendency to get ear infections, and if, you st if that still can't stop you, then every time you pluck the dog's ears, always put some uh, little amount of steroids in there to decrease the inflammation. This might be a time when you might want, even want to use a combination ear product that has a little bit of bacterial anti-yeast, antibacterial, and steroid in there to, to calm the infection down because it's very, very uncomfortable in that ear and very tender. So you know, we'd like to be a little bit more careful, especially since this is something which is recognized as a common practice and also something which commonly leads to disease. So getting off my stand for <laughs> plucking of hairs. Let's talk about one-time triggers and treatment. Now, when we're back to our little plastic um, model, when you want to do gentle ear cleaning, probably the simplest thing to do is to take your cotton ball, which is in that ear there, and saturate it with your ear cleaner, gently tuck it into the ear and squeeze, and allow the ear material to drizzle, literally drizzle down into the ear, and then gently massage the ear. I prefer this technique over squirting ear cleaner directly into the ear canal because the ear, first of all, it could if there's bacteria or yeast or anything there, you can contaminate the tip. Secondly, squirting a cold stream of fluid into the ear is uncomfortable. Also, in some dogs, um, when you when that fluid hits the um, ear and the middle ear, it can make them very very dizzy and they can get vestibular signs and that's very scary because it can also look like a seizure. Uh, so I do, I prefer this. And then um, use, when you are using an ear uh, cleaning product or a topical, you know, use something which is antibacterial, gently cleaning it, use um, for treatment, use a combination otic product such as with an antibiotic, antifungal, and steroid. And there are many, many products out on, on the market available uh, to use. Um, when you are putting in um, drops into the ear, it is important to kind of look at that ear and look at that canal and, and think about it. If you just put one or two drops in there, do you really think it's going to cover the surface area? No. You really need to put in a generous amount. And there have been a number of dermatologists that have done some smaller studies where um, they've actually looked at, you know, the volume of ear medication maybe directly related to the outcome. 
So when you, especially when you're using very liquid products, products that are an ointment and that, that can stay around a little bit, um, again, you still need to use a little bit more than just a few drops because all it's going to do is just um, essentially probably won't even make it in, into the, um, the outer part of the vertical canal, and you want to treat that whole canal. Um, probably one of the um, questions someone's going to ask is about ear cleaning. Do I like Q-tips and I don't? Um, I like if anywhere you can put your finger is great to clean. Now, complicated otitis. That's a dog that has very severe ear disease, and there's generally signs of other skin disease present. This can happen at any age. Um, the ears are obviously affected, painful. Um, it's usually a bilateral. One-time trigger diseases, simpler things, may often be just one ear. So that may be a clue, bilateral ear disease. It's, and if you have any kind of history, particularly if animals are being surrendered, most people will tell you that the problem's been going on for a while and it's complicated. It might have been something curable uh, and simple when it first happened, but for whatever reason, um, things didn't resolve, and there you are with a chronic case of otitis. So at intake, when an animal is presented to you, your visual exam is really important. One of the most important things you're doing with your visual exam is just looking to see if the ear disease is bilateral. You're looking to see if there's ulcers. You're looking and feel, you're, you're trying to feel how compressible is that ear canal. If it's easily compressible, that's a good sign, meaning that uh, there hasn't been a lot of damage to the canal. If it's harder to compress, it's getting fibrose, indicates chronicity, start thinking about allergies, seborrhea. Um, if you can't close it down at all, it just feels like a rock as this um, Cocker Spaniel is in the corner, that indicates um, that what you have is a very serious ear problem that probably isn't going to be able to be easily managed medically. So just those two things, you know, just looking at it um, will help. Now, another thing you can do is you can listen. As you're sort of, you know, manipulating the ear, you can listen to, to see, uh, or excuse me, to see, to hear. Do you, do you hear fluid in there? It sort of sounds like, like that. And, you'll, and that's fluid in there, and that usually indicates um, a very severe otitis externa and possibly an otitis media. Obviously, don't forget your nose. Your nose can always help, too, in identifying things. But the palpation and visual exam is important. Okay, triaging. Do we have end-stage ears? If you look at this Cocker Spaniel, one might think that somebody's calling his name and his ears are perked forward because you know, he's paying attention to you. Well, unfortunately, this dog hasn't been able to put, rest his ears back for a long time. This is what we saw when we flipped over the dog's ear. The entire, not only was the ear canal cauliflowered on the inside, but that cauliflowered material extended all the way out to the ear pinna, and the ears were hard as rocks. This type of patient, when seen, is a patient which is immediately best treated by aggressive surgery called the total ear canal ablation. And this can be life-changing in dogs um, and can totally change a dog's disposition who's been really, really grumpy and irritable, um, can be totally different in, within a few hours of surgery because this is so painful a disease. And these dogs do really, really well. But if you see this, this is a situation to immediately powwow about and decide, you know, are we in a position to do, you know, have the dog adopted by somebody who knows they're going to do end state, um total ear canal ablation, do we do this now before we adopt the dog, um, what's our best option there? Now, uh, cost-effective diagnostics, if you need to convince somebody or you're not convinced that this is an end-stage ear, simple things to do is radiographs or, if you have access to it, a CT scan to look to see, do I have any salvageable ear there? Is there calcification present? And another thing that may be important, even if the ear canals are hard and partially open, would be to do a culture to determine whether or not you've got multi-drug resistance. If you have an infection and it is resistant to all of the bacteria, that, excuse me, the antibiotics that you can test for, it may be impossible to resolve the infection because it isn't just on the surface of the ear, it's deep into the tissues, um, like a cellulitis, like a severe cat bite abscess, but on the ear. Um, and then occasionally, you know, it becomes a very emotional situation where everyone's not really sure. We, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but sometimes we can do um, a steroid trial to decrease stenosis. When we're doing these cost-effective diagnostics, what we're trying to actually answer the question is, is, 
have an end-stage ear if there's any question. Is there any chance it could be managed medically? Because if not, then we're talking about surgery. Okay, so confirmation of um, end-stage ear disease. On the right, um, you, you can see the arrow is pointing to a normal air-filled ear canal. And you can see it on both the right and the left sides. You see nice, um, dark, um, air-filled ear canal. And that dog has normal ears. On the left, you don't see that. And then also, um, when you see where the ear tissue would be, you see some dark, excuse me, some white, dense material, not as dense as the skull, but very similar to it. And that's calcification. Once you see that, and this is just on plain film radiographs, so if you're in a situation where you can do radiographs and you can do really well-positioned radiographs under general anesthesia, lay the dog on his back and fold those ears out, you, you might be able to see that and you wouldn't have to necessarily refer the dog for anything further. This indicates end-stage ear disease, and the next step is, is how do we get the dog medical, the medical and surgical treatment that he needs. Okay. Now, what happens in a total ear canal ablation? Well, this is a dog with huge, the ear canal is totally obliterated by this proliferative tissue, didn't respond to steroids, um, and very well may have had resistant infections. But in this surgery, what they do is they save the pinna, and what they do is they remove everything, they remove the canal and all that proliferative tissue. And at the end of surgery, um, this is a dog I actually had um, taken care of, the ear looks completely cosmetically normal, and that pipe underneath, the, the, the vertical pipe underneath the sink and the horizontal pipe, as we talked about, all that's been removed in any um, tissue that needs to be removed um, to help cure it. And this little dog um, had surgery. Uh, she was a great dog, and it um, was a situation where her owner had a medical emergency, and she needed to... She was ready to go home, and she needed to go home, so I took her home. She was a great dog, and I got a lot of experience um, for a couple of weeks taking care of one of these dogs post-op. So I can tell you that they do really well. This dog was a totally different dog, much more active post-surgery, even though she was you know, painful. Ate, played. Um, she was um, good here because one ear was only, it was only the in fact, um, surgery was only done on one ear, but um, she did well. Um, dogs that have had the surgery on both ears, um, they don't hear um, because, the tympan because the eardrum is removed. Um, owners oftentimes report they think that the dogs are hearing, but sometimes vibrations on the, something we believe maybe vibrations are transmitted up into the dog's um, skull area, telling them something's going on uh, from their jaw. But dogs adapt really well to hand signals and just normal pattern routines uh, in the household. And dogs that live with another dog who's sort of their hearing aid dog, you'd never even know it. Uh, and but uh, but they do well. They do really well. Now, if you have if you, if you if you're thinking about the ear diseases, there's four big causes of of chronic otitis, and so we're past our triage of of that. And the first one is is there's an obstruction, and this can be a foreign body, this could be a tumor, or it could be treatable stenosis. So dogs coming in with chronic otitis, you're thinking, well, is there something there? And then the next thing is it's undiagnosed infection or resistant infection. Um, many times um, cultures haven't been done, things were treated empirically, which is perfectly reasonable to do, or maybe um, the yeast that were present uh, weren't treated and that has been perpetuating it. So that's one thing. And then you can have an undiagnosed middle ear infection and also a perpetuating underlying trigger such as um, allergies and seborrheic disease. So when you have a dog with chronic otitis, Think, is there an obstruction? Is there a resistant infection? Could there be a middle ear disease? Or is there um, an underlying whole body disease? And you can have multiple disease. But just getting those four things down and thinking about them will help you figure out what to do. Now, obstruction. This is, includes, but it's not limited to, inflammation, swelling, foreign bodies, tumors being present, uh, breed-related, such as... Um, Sharpays. So what can we do for proliferative otitis that's due to stenosis? So if a dog comes in and you feel an obstruction, um, you don't think it's mechanical or, or you don't think it's a tumor uh, or some other type of foreign body, it just looks like proliferative otitis, we can do a steroid response to treatment trial. And this is what we do to try to shrink down that tissue because the tissue in the 
canal will proliferate uh, just like any other tissue. And so what we'll do is we'll give a milligram per kilogram orally of prednisone 15 to 30 days and look to see does the canal open up. And it's amazing. Some dogs that uh, the call, I'll get a call from owners and they'll say, you know what, my dog can hear. He hasn't heard in a long time. Bilateral stenosis, the dog gets on steroids. We open up the ear canal. He doesn't feel like he's underwater, and he's doing great. And this is the ear after steroids in the same dog, and a lo- all the swelling of that tissue has gone down. If that happens, this is something which can be managed medically, and the way we would manage that is look for the underlying trigger. Usually it's a seborrheic disease or allergy, but also then try to keep that ear from getting swollen again by using um, maintenance dose of ear cleaning and topical steroids. Okay, now, of course, foreign bodies. Um, there's all sorts of foreign bodies. Tumors are a big one, as is indicated here, or polyps. But this is, uh, the pencil is there for a reference for size, but this is a collection of the things that I have removed from dog's ears. The only thing not shown there is a tiny little matchbox car, which was um, parked in the garage of the ear garage of a basset hound by a small child. But it is amazing what finds its way into the dog's ears, especially when there's children present. And you're looking down the ear and you see something, you know, kind of purple or green. You're going, wow, that's kind of odd. So foreign bodies can not just be tumors. They can actually be something you can remove. All right. So what else about ear tumors um, is important? Well, ear tumors... Um, usually are considered to be, you know, when people talk about tumors, you usually think, oh, well, you know, cancer is developed in the ear. But what has been recently published is that dogs with chronic ear disease in both ears, the inflammation has gone on to develop into um, dysplastic, disorganized tissue, which then went on to develop into uh, bilateral ear neoplasia um, in the ears, such as this. Um, This is proliferative tissue when it was, histologically examined, um, there was uh, cancer of the ear tissue that was present. So bilateral ear canal, um, total ear canal ablations was curative for for, um, this problem. But that is a good reason to get a biopsy of tissues. And, you know, especially when people are doing total ear canal ablations, that's why they always take a biopsy of it, because they want to know have they missed a tumor. Usually these tumors are locally invasive, um, but we do want to know um, just in case they are more um, aggressive and start to spread. Um, of course, then you also have stenosis, which is uh, Sharpay's. Um, no amount of surgery will open these ear canals up. These are ears which are chronically managed. Some of these dogs get pulse um, oral steroids to keep their ears open, but most of them, if they have ear problems, it's ear cleaning and topical steroids. And then there is another um, disease, it's not something that we've just recently discovered, it's just something that we now recognize, in uh, Cavalier King Charles Spaniels. And this is a disease called primary secretary otitis media of these dogs' ears. Um, They may present with ear pain, shaking, deafness. You look in the ear, you don't see anything. Um, If you can do an otoscopic exam, you might see sort of a bulgy tympanic membrane. And what's inside the ear is just mucus. And on the top, that's just a little... um, bit of mucus on the end of a swab being kind of pulled out of the ear, and this is mucus uh, being stretched, kind of like joint fluid, um, in between my fingers and my hands, and it's mucusy. How do you treat that? Well, you can flush the ears with a middle ear irrigation um, that may relieve it for a short period of time or a long period of time, but oftentimes it's needed to be repeated over and over. It's, It's not something that we can cure. It's something that we can manage. Okay. Undiagnosed or resistant infections, um, it can complicate any of these. And you can have treatment-related problems such as compliance issues with with, uh, getting um, medication in the ear. And I don't just mean the owner. Sometimes the dogs are not compliant at all because the ears are painful. Um, Or maybe the treatment with uh, drugs has been the dose was too low or the treatment was too short. Low doses of antibiotics and too short a treatment are two big predisposing problems. Untreated malassezia or candida, uh, yeast infections in the ears, um, and many times they're untreated because they don't, they're not as, the numbers aren't as, as high as you see cocci or rods, so we don't think to or, or they're not treated um, as aggressively. But they um, are important, and oftentimes you can resolve these problems 
by treating everybody you find there in an inflamed ear. Sometimes you can have multiple strains of things or methicillin-resistant uh, isolates, and that may be it. So that's why cauldron susceptibility is important. And again, we've mentioned Rod several times. If you have a dog with a multidrug-resistant infection and it's been going on for any period of time, the only way to be um, completely rid and done of the problem may be a total ear canal ablation because it's oftentimes nearly impossible to find a topical that'll work. Um, and usually we're using um, products which are very expensive uh, because they're from the human sector and it costs a, lot, costs a lot of money to treat them. And yet the infection is sequestered into the tissue and we can't get rid of it. So, you know, for many of these dogs, when we look back, um, we think, you know, and uh, think, you know what, we probably should have gone to surgery a lot sooner. So the number of organisms, as I said before, doesn't reflect infection. Uh, so you need to pay attention if you've got an inflamed ear and a resistant infection, it's important. Uh, rods are the most worrisome, and that in particular is, is Pseudomonas. If you see rods on a slide in the dog with ear inflammation, it is um, an indication to do cultures. So that brings us to indications for ear cultures. And that's a little bit of pus at the end of the swab, uh, including but not limited to complicated ear infections. This is money well spent. You need to know what you're treating. Um, as opposed to just giving off, giving and prescribing antibiotics prophylactically. Once it's complicated, you need to guide. Uh, purulent ear disease, if you have a lot of exudate um, present, um, it's definitely indicated because you usually you have multiple things to, to do. If you have a dog with what seemed like a simple infection, treat it appropriately, just like you've treated 20, 30 other dogs in whatever period of time, and it doesn't respond to therapy, time to culture because you may have had a strain that was very susceptible but now has become resistant. Complicated ear infections, oh, I've mentioned that twice. Uh, finding rods on cytology. Um, persistent finding of bacteria. You're treating a dog, you're treating a dog, and the ear's inflamed and yet you still find bacteria, time to do it. Then another big cause is otitis media or middle ear disease. Um, oftentimes, um, middle ear disease will present with a dog with a head tilt. And that head tilt may be due to neurological problems or may simply be that the ear is so painful he's cocking his head to the side. Whoops, I think I think that kind of lost control there. I regained control, I hope. Okay, um, dogs that have got inner ear problems or dogs that present with their head tilt and they've got inner ear problems, they'll usually have nystagmus, they can't stand, they'll have vestibular signs, um, those dogs, you know, have middle ear disease, um, inner ear disease. Now, you can have middle ear disease or otitis media with evidence of, egg, of infection, such as on the upper left-hand side where you've got black debris coming out of the ear, or very annoyingly, the ear canal looks normal, yet the dog, you know, will have these intermittent ear infections or intermittent episodes of disease. You can have infection um, sequestered behind the tympanic membrane. The vertical canal looks good, the horizontal canal looks good, but that tympanic membrane can wall off infection and it may rupture and heal and rupture and heal. So one of the hallmarks of, recurrent, of, of uh, otitis media is recurrent infections of the ears that don't resolve. As far as what is happening there, in a dog with middle ear disease. So here we're looking at, um, on the top is a, is a picture of um, the normal ear, and that white part is the eardrum. And behind it, you can see the um, tympanic bulla, uh, the, the middle ear, and the organs of hearing. And it's nice and pink, and there's nothing there. When there is fluid or infection in there, it fills up that canal. So obviously, you don't get the ear canal isn't, um, eardrum rather, has to vibrate for sound to be transmitted, and then obviously if you have fluid in the ear, it doesn't get transmitted very well, so dogs don't hear as well. And then as the fluid builds up, you can see the bulge of the eardrum. That is really, really very, very painful. And small you know, children that get middle ear disease you know, are screaming at this point because it's so painful, and yet our dogs are very tolerant. When you, um, oftentimes, you know, when the eardrum ruptures, it releases the pressure, and um, the dog may actually feel a little bit better. The problem is still there, but the pain is, is finished. 
Now, this is a CT of a dog with a middle ear uh, disease. In, yeah, on the right-hand side, um, the cavity um, there is full, filled with air. Um, it's the one up to the uh, right-hand side. On the left, the parallel cavity is is filled with it's gray, meaning it's filled with fluid. And that's what it would look like on um, a CT exam of a dog with middle ear disease, either from fluid or from a tumor. Uh, can you see this on radiographs? Sure, you can. Um, but many times the better diagnostic is a CT if you can have that option. Um, but clearly, uh, radiographs, if that's the best you have to do, can uh, definitely be helpful. Lynn, you're back. Okay, we have, yes, and this has been very interesting, Dr. Moriello. Um, we have another poll question for the audience. Uh, do you do middle ear flushes in your organization? Yes, no, don't know, or not applicable. Do you do middle ear flushes in your organization? And as we're almost getting to the end of the presentation, I want to encourage you one more time to get your questions in for Dr. Moriello. So let's go and look at our results. Hey, it seems like just a small number of people do them, um, and the majority don't. There's a lot of reasons not to. Um, not to be able to do them. Um, what's necessary for a middle ear flush um, for dogs is the ability to actually, you know, have a strong indication of it, have general anesthesia, and um, some equipment. Now, contrary to what you might believe, you don't need to have a very expensive um, ear video otoscope. You can do this with a um, instrumentation uh, otoscopic head. Uh, so, what are you looking at here? Well. We're looking back at that same little plastic model. Got a lot of mileage out of it in this talk. What you're looking at is the ear, and what that little white tube there is, is that's a tom that is a, a Tomcat catheter. When we do a middle ear irrigation, we will get any samples that we need, put them aside, clean up the ear, shape up the ear, clean out the ear canal, and then um, using a sterile uh, cone, we will put an otoscopic um, otoscope in the ear with the cone, and gently snake this little Tomcat catheter down there while we're looking and make a tiny little puncture in the eardrum between 5 and 7 o'clock. And that is what's called the myringotomy, and that is the basic thing you need to do for an ear flush. Um, so you need the general anesthesia, you need good visualization, so you need a decent um, uh, otoscope. Um, but you, you don't have to have a video otoscope. You can definitely do it in practices. Now on the right hand side what you're looking at is there is an otoscope inside of a, a dog's ear um, and there's a cone there and up along probably about 11 o'clock is a little white um, Tomcat catheter and what's happened there is we've got been flushing fluid into um, clear saline into the ear and it is bubbling up and it is rinsing out and essentially removing all of the packed in debris that is in the middle ear, and all that black flocculent material was pus and debris in the middle ear. And you would just keep doing this over and over again um, until you get um, a clear uh, fluid coming back. Um, and there are many, many audio tutorials and webcasts available on the web for the veterinarians in the audience who would like to try to do this about how, how to do it. Um, one of the most important things to do if you're going to be doing a middle ear flush is to get a culture. So, you know, when you're culturing an ear, um, you generally have two sizes of swabs, the really big ones and the tiny little ones. Um, you see them in the upper left-hand corner. They've, I've dyed the cotton blue so that you can see the size. The blue ones, uh, the big ones, are excellent for when you're culturing the vertical and horizontal canal. Um, they're very difficult and nearly impossible, unless you want to cause a lot of damage to the dog's ear, to get into the middle ear canal. The mini-tip culturettes are best avoided when culturing dog's nails because you really don't get a lot of material on the surface, but they're absolutely ideal for placing down through your dissecting head otoscope uh, and cone into the middle ear uh, canal, through the, uh, into the uh, middle ear through your little myringotomy slot and getting some of the exudate. One technique I like a little better uh, to getting an ear culture 
back over here to our thing is when we make our first little incision into the ear with our Tomcat catheter is to have about two mils of sterile saline on the end of a syringe and flush that into the bulla and then aspirate it out, such as what you see on the bottom here, uh, a slide, and remove the debris. And that has a lot of you know, bacteria. It's a great way of getting, getting a culture from it. Um, if for some reason you are unable to submit the fluid for culture, for whatever reason, you can uh, then take your bigger culturette tube and you know, saturate it with this material, squirt some of this material on that, and then put it back into its culture um, transport tube. Um, that's just something to keep in mind there. Now, um, talked about obstruction, undiagnosed infections, um, middle ear disease, and then the other big trigger for chronic ear disease is an underlying um, skin disease. First one is allergic skin diseases, such as allergies to food or, or environmental allergies, which is the big one, causing current inflammation of the ears. That's a contact problem with the pollens and molds, and obviously where the dog's nose goes, his ears follow, and so ears are often affected. And then um, a primary disorder of um, cretinization or sabria. And we talked about these in the Itchy Dog webinar and the Sabaria webinar uh, as two big causes. Okay, so allergic ear diseases. Um, these are some ears uh, typical of dogs with allergic ear disease. You may just have redness and itchy ears. The ears may start to get a little bit lichenified, and um, lichenification just means sort of thickening. It just looks like sort of elephant skin on the ear. And, you know, these dogs, as part of their whole body management for allergic skin disease, to have some chronic lifelong therapy for the ears involving cleaning and some anti-inflammatories present. Otherwise, you will just forever have ear disease going on. And if you let it go untreated, these dogs then have this tiny little incubator of inflammation, there'll be moisture, there'll be bacteria present, and they're set up to get resistant infections. They're set up to get middle ear disease. And then, of course, there is our primary disorder of cornification. This is a very, very extreme case of primary uh, seborrhea in a cocker spaniel. The base is affected, and of course, the ear is just you know, very, very proliferative. However, it doesn't always present that way. It can be a lot less dramatic. The ear canal can be open, patent, and you can just start getting the little um, bumps of the ear, All the, they all have names, getting more proliferative. And these are, this is the kind of patient dog you want to identify readily because these are the ones that you can prevent or greatly slow down the risk um, of having them develop end-stage ear disease. Okay, so there are some urgent treatment goals when you're dealing with any dog. Um, the first thing is, is you know, your immediate triage. What Do we have end-stage ear disease? Because if you do, what you need to do to address uh, how to get this dog surgery. In the meantime, while you're trying to do that, hygiene is important and pain management. Um, if you don't have end-stage ear disease, you want to do something to decrease inflammation, which is going to involve cleaning and glucocorticoids. corticoids. You want to decrease the mechanical occlusion and swelling. Sometimes that requires oral steroids, maybe a short course or a longer course, depending upon how severe it is, or even topicals. If a dog's ear is really painful, um, it may be much better to just administer a short course of oral prednisone for several days to bring down the swelling and inflammation in that ear before even trying to clean it, before even trying to do anything more with it because it can be uncomfortable. You need to treat microorganisms, which means somehow you have to be able to get a slide sample of it uh, to find out what you need to treat um, and manage pain. Steroids will do a very good job of managing pain in the ear um, of swelling, but to a point. Sometimes steroids alone will not manage pain, and then um, you need to add a second drug. And you cannot uh, mix steroids and non-steroidal. So this is where a drug such as tramadol may be very useful. Obviously, there's problems, concerns with prescribing it and cautions, but it can be helpful. And then coat hygiene. This is a close-up of that dog that I showed you, and you can see along the ear margin, the hairs are matted. Um, they've gotten so matted that they're kind of turning black and adhering. This is horribly odorous. 
this um, is it does nothing to treat the ear without addressing this kind of ear disease and hygiene. And not only is it on the ear, but when that ear flaps over, it's all over the dog's neck. So um, it's a matter these dogs need a really good clip short clip. Um, minimally for the in for dogs with chronic ear disease, I like to have all the hair shaved off the inside of the ear and, uh, and meet the ear and along the neck to make it easier to clean. It makes them much better pets. And the odor is hugely problematic with this dog getting, being a member of the family, having people being willing to treat it. Um, and just, you know, socially, I mean, when your dog's ears stink, it's a problem. And there have been people who have really um, had dogs that smell so bad we can smell them at, when they walk in the front door. And imagine trying to drive in a car with that dog or, or live with that dog. We need to be able to do something. And basically shampooing and re shaving and shampooing are two big things which help a lot. Okay, so why steroids? Topical steroids alone are great for allergic dogs or good for dogs that have got just mild disorders of keratinization. They're used because in this case, one of the major problems with keeping an ear infection going is the secretion and the swelling. And so the only way to address it is with steroids. So it's one of the few places where we mix steroids and antimicrobials. Now one of my most commonly prescribed steroids I use is something called we call dexamethasone eardrops, and it's equal parts of dexamethasone injectable with propylene glycol. And the prescription usually says put 10 drops um, twice a day for seven days and once a day for seven days and then as needed. Well, 10 drops is what we, is required to put on our pharmacy prescription because you know, pharmacists are you know, very into precision dosing. The reality is it's a squirt, and this is very inexpensive to make. You don't have to get it into the actual ear orifice itself. You, if you can just even just fold the pin up like a funnel and squirt it into that and let it um, gently drizzle down into the ear, and it's quite effective that way. And again, very inexpensive. Combination products. Um, there's a wide number of them available, but they uniformly have an antibacterial, an antifungal, and some type of steroid there. Injectable steroids. I have used injectable steroids, um, short-acting injectable steroids in dogs that can't be med cannot be medicated orally um, because of any number of reasons. Um, oftentimes the dogs are too painful, or maybe the or owners can't do it. Um, so you can administer um, several days of that, and that will be very, very helpful to some to some dogs. Um, or in a situation where maybe um, there isn't someone to medicate the dog over the weekend, take care of them, but not necessarily medicate them, or the dog is difficult to medicate, a dose for 72 hours may be very helpful, and dexamethasone is very helpful there. And again, oral steroids that we've talked about. So you know, you want to go with the least amount of steroids you need. So think, you know, can I? Is this amendable to topical therapy? But if not, um, then let's go with a more potent uh, administration method, such as oral steroids. And um, it doesn't have to be very long. The only time it's long is when you're trying to really shrink ear tissue. Then, as far as you know, reducing mechanical occlusion or ear cleaning. First question is: Is sedation necessary? And and you know, if a dog has mildly little bit dirty ears, kind of like just plain dirty ears, probably sedation isn't necessary unless the dog really um, objects to being handled. Otherwise, sedation is really very humane because this is painful. When dogs are under anesthesia and we're cleaning and manipulating their ears, we can have them essentially wake up from anesthesia if they're not kept in a deep surgical plane. So it's not light anesthesia. They, they need a, a fair degree of sedation and, and anesthesia when you really have to clean an aggressive ear. So you need to make sure that you do that. Sometimes you can use less sedation if you can medicate with pain meds. Um, but to the veterinarians in the office, I, uh, audience, I know that you probably um, have a good handle on what you need to do. But again, I, I think it's um, really necessary. Cleaning ears without sedation is what, what makes dogs very fearful of veterinarians. So when you put an ear cleaner in, it's important to instill it and allow it to work. Now, many times people overuse ear cleaners because they're trying to use ear cleaner to get all the debris off the ear and everything. So it might be really helpful when you have a dog with really bad ears to go ahead and instill the ear cleaner and then just do a whole body grooming and bathing to remove all the debris. And then towel the dog off, maybe instill a little bit more ear cleaner to 
help allow it to work. It takes about five, ten minutes to work, you know, and gently massage it into the ear uh, to do it. If you just squirt it in and wipe it out, you might as well be squirting in water because it's not going to work. Um, it doesn't allow it uh, to, um, to go ahead and lift off the debris and lift off the oils and exudate from the ear. And then just gently mechanical removal of debris, um, you know, Ear swabs for in between all the outside little cracks and crevices of the ear are fine. Within the ear canal, there's too much danger that you can pack materials in there or accidentally pack materials in there. And if the eardrum is very, very friable, maybe rupture it. In severe ear disease, oftentimes eardrum, you know, when we get down to looking at the ear canal after some cleaning, we'll see it ruptured. We don't know if it was ruptured to begin with or ruptured during the ear cleaning. But you really want to avoid doing that um, with um, you know, routine ear cleaning or doing um, a lot of aggressive uh, cleaning of the ears because it, it is quite uncomfortable and it can bruise the ear and cause damage where you didn't have any. Then you want to clean and massage and then always apply some odic steroids um, post-cleaning. Now, everybody has different things that they like to do and use for ear cleaners. However, um, here's you know, these products are not appropriate for ear cleaning. Hydrogen peroxide is inactivated in presence of pus, so it's useless. Um, rubbing alcohol is extraordinarily painful and toxic to tissues. Um, there seems to be a lot of um, uh, kind of um, just um, chat rooms and discussions about using uh, various um, oils in the ears uh, for ear cleaning and routine ear cleaning. Um, these are best avoided because um, many of these oils, um, if you look at them, up, um, they're used to as part of the growth media for yeast. So this is where you, know, you don't really want to be adding oil to the ears because you might actually be perpetuating the growth of malathesia. So there are no. After that, there's a lot of products available, and use what you like and what seems to um, uh, to work uh, for you. If you're worried about ears, you know, ototoxicity or or, or um, any kind of inflammation, use your ear cleaner and just flush out. Uh, the, um, the ear cleaner. So after you clean it, remove it, use gel water to flush it out and aspirate it out to kind of dilute it. Now, as far as like removing mechanical materials, something I really like a lot better than alligator forceps, I mean these are great for grabbing something, is pediatric ear curettes and you can use them to gently scrape material off of the ears in place of trying to dig it out with a, with a swab. The tips are very bendable. These are very inexpensive. These are very, very soft. Um, and you can um, just Google them and, and, and find them quite easily. And I, and I think they're definitely worth it. They're used once and tossed, so that makes it you know, very sanitary. Now, many times a question I get is, you know, do you like using um, ear bulbs, like people for cleaning ears or children's nose, so bulb syringes? Well. If they're brand new out of a package and you use them once on a patient, then you throw them away, great. Otherwise, no, because in the left-hand picture, there's so many things wrong there. First of all, um, the person's not wearing gloves. To compound it, there apparently appears to be some kind of an injury on their hand, and there's a Band-Aid on it. That ear, who knows what is growing in that ear? Um, we don't want to be having infections seeded into our hands, so you need to always wear gloves with ears. That ear bulb... Um, that particular ear bulb, um, when we went to culture it, after trying to clean it with soap and water and trying to clean it with an alcohol disinfectant, we were still able to grow these bacteria that you see on the plate on the right-hand side. So, And that bacteria matched exactly what was in that dog's ear. So it is um, very, very high risk to, use, um, those, um, to reuse those bulb syringes. And also, another thing which gets easily contaminated are the, um, the otoscopic cone that you wash. Um, I would recommend using disposable otoscopic uh, cones. Um, they're very inexpensive uh, to use. And also, make sure that you, the tip of the bottle does not touch the, um, the ear tissue at all, because you can contaminate an entire bottle of ear cleaner that way. And then you're sort of like the typhoid ear mary person. Okay, so in treating microorganisms, what do you do? Well, routine cleaning, you know, if you've got problems, you 
these products with Tris buffered EDTA. What is that? That is a solution which helps make the walls of bacteria more friable and more susceptible to antimicrobials that'll be put in the ears. So use ear cleaners with that. It's a great aid. Uh, use your topical combination products with the steroids. If you have a severe otitis media, a severe otitis externa, you'll need systemic antimicrobials, usually antibiotics based upon culture susceptibility. If it's chronic, um, I'm not, um, because of the high resistance, acetone resistant staphs and pseudomonases, um, I don't recommend the use of fluoroquinolones except based upon a, uh, upon a culture and susceptibility. Um, you need to monitor your patients with, exam, with exams and cytologies. If you're repeatedly if you're treating an animal appropriately, but yet you're getting nowhere, you still have pus, you still have bacteria, you might have to move to the next step. Maybe you didn't do a mill ear irrigation. Maybe that's needed. Maybe you've done all that and you still have the infection. Maybe it's time for surgery. Okay, addressing the underlying trigger is huge. Um, is it treatable and curable, such as ear mites, um, foreign bodies, allergies, or underlying primary disorder of creatinization, you or, or seborrhea, you'll treat the ears, but you're not going to get anywhere unless the rest of the um, dog's problems are addressed. Um, and you know you can stabilize these patients and make your observations known, so when their adopters get them, they can have something to follow up on. So the question is, is where are foster families needed, and how do we help these dogs get them into homes? Well, the first place I think is that is is if um, total ear canal ablations or TICA surgeries are available to you, it is the post-surgical care of these dogs. And um, these dogs do take a fair amount of time, but it is not so time intensive that you can't put them in a foster home. Some of the things would be to have several of the um, Elizabethan collars there because during the first couple days of treatment, um, there's a lot of dra there's drains in there and there's a lot of exudate, and it's hard to keep those clean um, so you can clean it, you can have several of them and just clean the dog site and wound and put a fresh collar on maybe twice a day if needed. They need pain medication. Um, usually after about 48 to 72 hours, I'm really surprised they're, they're just, you know, running around like had major ear surgery and, and they're just hugely playful. Um, so, but it's really more the exudate, the swelling, and when can they leave foster families? They can leave the foster family when the drain comes out and when there's no more exudate there, and that can be, you know, as short as, as a week to 10 days. And then they can go on their way to a permanent loving home. The acute management of seborrheic otitis, where we're needing to give doses, oral doses of steroids for 15 to 30 days. Also, those dogs need a lot of shampoo therapy to help get their whole body in remission because it's not going to just be lifted up to the ears. That's the acute management there. And again, um, those dogs drink a lot, they urinate a lot, they eat a lot. Um, there can be personality changes with steroids. So you want them in a situation where they can be watched really, really closely. Um, during the itchy dog workup for dogs with allergies, um, we talked before in the previous webinar about the, uh, the triage for that, um, but that can be done, those six weeks of triage can be done in, um, in a foster family setting. Um, and acute management to remission of, of diagnosed allergic otitis. You've got a dog with allergies. The dog is really, really itchy and painful. Maybe this dog needs injectable steroids. Maybe this dog needs more aggressive treatment. That works and not very long. Post-myringotomy, middle ear flush. Um, the complications of myringotomy. Well, besides being painful, um, you can have um, a temporary and sometimes, unfortunately, permanent head tilt. Um, some dogs will have vestibular signs afterwards. Sometimes they'll have some blood or exudate draining from the ear. These dogs frequently need um, you know, some type of medication uh, administered not only orally but topically. And this is probably best done um, in a home situation. And it's not impossible to do. Uh, treatment of dogs with pseudomonas ear infections. Um, again, you need to choose your foster family carefully. I wouldn't want to place a dog with a pseudomonas ear infection in a home where there's someone with um, that's immunocompromised, um, or even um, with children, because these dogs are painful um, and they they're somewhat um, grumpy. Uh, and also, you know, if you've got a severe pseudomonas infection, um, although we don't really see this as a zoonotic disease, there are times when it's just best not to place some animals in home with children. Okay, I think that brings me to the end of my um, session, and I'm happy to turn it back over to Lynn.
Yes. Well, we're not finished yet, Dr. Moriello. We have some really good questions for you, so we'll go on ahead and get the first one up. Are there otitis cases in which you recommend oral antibiotics in addition to topicals? Um, yes, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, when a dog has um, neutrophil septic, it's, uh, you have neutrophilic exudate, and the ear canal is extremely painful, um, I recommend both oral and topicals um, because that oral antibiotics um, will make it into that tissue because if it's ulcerated and there's neutrophils there, you've got clearly a break in the skin defense um, of the ear, and that will significantly shorten uh, the course of the um, otitis and, and speed resolution of it. Great. Thank you. And here's the next question. Do you recommend once a day or twice a day cleaning and medicating for un uncomplicated otitis? Does the recommendation change for complicated otitis cases? Um, okay. I think that when we're talking about ear cleaning, when you have got um, the acute disease, um, once a day is more than adequate, and that should be at a time when everybody has time. Um, and regarding complicated otitis, um, cleaning the ears once a day is, is more than adequate. However, I know that these dogs can oftentimes build up a lot of exudate on the outer ear, and so that's where a washcloth um, can be used to remove the debris from there. As the question always comes up with, and probably maybe my next question, when do you go from once a day um, ear cleaning to, to less than that. As the de debris decreases, you can decrease the frequency of cleaning. What I feel when you're cleaning the ears of dogs with severe otitis, it is better to do frequent but very gentle cleanings than be real aggressive because you can damage the tissue. The analogy I make is removing the finish from a fine piece of furniture. Um, it's better to do it very gently and over a period of time than to get very aggressive because you can cause more harm. And since you have to manipulate these dogs, you don't want it to be painful. And so, you know, you want to start cleaning the ears when they can easily be damaged. Next question. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you use dex... Uh, I'm sorry, do you use dexamethasone or dexxsp? Where can you get propylene glycol? Okay, I'm not sure what dexsp is. But the dexamethasone I'm using um, is the injectable dexamethasone. I'm not using, it's, oh, I, I know, I'm uh, sodium. That you're, I'm using the injectable, um, not the shock dose, not the um, uh, sodium succinate. Uh, so um, just uh, usually the equine product. And propylene glycol, um, that, can, um, that can be purchased. Um, I, I would uh, talk to your distributors because it comes in bulk. Um, so any of your drug distributors should be able to help you find a source of, 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 uh, of propylene glycol. It's a carrier base, and it's very commonly used in most of your products. Okay, thank you. Here's the next one. Uh, do you have success managing auroral hematomas with the course of prednisone instead of surgery? Okay, um, management, those are the ear hematomas with prednisone instead of surgery. Sometimes. Now, with um, an oral hematoma, it will um, resolve on its own. Um, it's painful for the dog, and they and they you know they will flop around and have their ear you know, held at a funny angle for a long time, and it can take a long time for the blood to reabsorb, and then it leaves a very bad. It's very uncosmetic. However, you you will meet dogs that have, have had uh, no surgery and had to do it. When you're using glucocorticoids instead of surgery, um, the best option is surgery. For them, that'll give you the most cosmetic effect, and it gives you the best chance of of, um, of getting um, the, the problem solved in the shortest period of time. But there are times when surgery is not an option. When you're using PRED, what you need to do is you need to evacuate and remove the the blood that's in the ear. And I've seen people do a couple of different things. Um, you know, they'll inject steroids into the ear or um, administer oral steroids. The the problem um, with using with using the steroids injectably is it decreases the inflammation, um, but because there's a space there, it's going to fill up with um, blood right away. Oral steroids usually are working because the dog is itchy and it has allergic ear disease. So when you're using oral steroids and you're having success, most likely what is happening is 
the dog's itchy, stopping its itching of its ear. You evacuate the oral hematoma. Maybe you um, bandage it somehow so that there's pressure on it. Um, and then that makes the dog comfortable. He doesn't flap his ear, and he doesn't. Um, we um, have the oral hematoma doesn't recur. Um, I don't like the teeth canals um, for perpetual drainage um, very much because what you have then is blood dripping into the vertical ear canal. Somehow it always gets in there. Um, and essentially, just remember, what do you grow bacteria on? Blood, blood agar plates. So that can be really complicating, and, and, and you can go from an oral hematoma to a resistant or complicated infection. I'm done. <laughs> Next, Next question. question. When is uh, Bulla ostomini indicated? And that's a bully osteotomy. So if osteotomy. you remember, that, yeah, that's okay. If you can remember back uh, to the um, the picture where we had the audience. There we go. Okay. What we're talking about with a bully osteotomy is on the left-hand side there, um, there's that opening there. And what a bully osteotomy is, for those who don't know, it is where you go in um, and open up this bulla with some bone uh, curettes and scrape out the contents. That would be indicated, um, it always happens during a total ear canal ablation. It would happen when there is a, uh, a tumor there to remove it. And maybe the treatment course, um, if the dog has middle ear disease, we've been unable to resolve it with um, flushing and um, the material is packed um, or insipated, thickened, and dried in there so hard that the only way to get it is to to read it out, um, and that um, procedure then um, is leaves the dog. Um, it eventually heals over, but there's usually a drain there present for a period of time. So those are my indications. Excellent. All right, here when, we go yep. with another question. Do you find more or less ear problems with cropped ears? Oh, I wish I could really answer that question, but I just don't see that many dogs with cropped ears anymore. That seems to not be very popular in the uh, the Midwest here. Um, so the question would be: Is you know, w the assumption is, is 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 does removing the floppy ear part um, prevent the dog from having um, ear disease? Well, ear disease um, is in the dogs that get their ears cropped uh, for cosmetic reasons or for use reasons. Um, if they are predisposed to an underlying skin disease, it will do no difference at all. You will you will still have ear disease there. So it won't. It is not a way of preventing ear disease in the dog, which is programmed to have it because they have allergies or primary seborrhea. So if someone's asking me, is it a good indication to prevent ear disease? I would say no. The problems with cropped ears that we do see um, is essentially um, non-healing. Um, Cropped ears, you know, because the ear tissue doesn't have the cartilage, it's difficult to get that to heal. So that that might be one one problem with it. But that that practice is less and less common. Very good. Here's another question: What is the shelf life of dexamethasone injectable mixed with propylene glycol? Can it be kept at room temperature once mixed, and for how long, in your experience? Okay. Um, the shelf life. Um, every pharmacist will put an expiration date on it. I am not aware that that it um, expires at any period of time. Um, I would probably not keep it for more than I would mix it up in small amounts and keep it for approximately six months. Um, I think a bigger potential risk is just that um, the uh, the tip may get contaminated, um, and you know, lots of times because it's sort of an oily solution, the label falls off of it, and then you don't know, do I have dexamethasone? What do I have in this bottle? So six months at the most. Yes, it can be kept at room temperature, um, and like I said, for six months. So, Okay, thank you. Here's another. What is it when the inside of the ear appears fuzzy gray and it occurs every few months and needs to be cleaned out, usually accompanied by dark debris, and then treated with topical treatment drops or ointment? When you have any kind of inflammation happening every few months and then dark debris, that to me suggests uh, two things. You've got a lot of buildup of ceruminous material, normal cerumen that may or may not have yeast in there, and that what appears to be that 
kind of fuzzy gray material may very well be um, uh, a dog with mild seborrheic otitis uh, present. Um, and this is, um, and then having it respond to drops or ointments is really indicative that there's a chronic underlying disease. So one way to kind of get out of the cycle would be once you get the ears in remission, get that patient, that dog, on a treatment of a protocol for routine ear cleaning once or twice a week, followed by some topical steroid eardrops once or twice a week. Um, then look at the big picture of the dog and and think, you know, well, what's causing this, and what do I else do I do, do more? But even in dogs with well controlled atopy or seborrhea, they need lifelong maintenance therapy on their ears. There's just no ifs ands or buts about it. The only thing that changes is, you know, sometimes it's once a week and sometimes it's twice a week. Okay, can you okay, describe ma'am? how you do ear cytology? Do you always use diff quick stain? Okay, so doing ear um, cytology, take a, a, a dry cotton tip applicator. Um, I will I pick the ear up and I will flip it over the dog. I try not to, try not to pull it back too much because it's painful. Get a fair amount of debris on there, gently rolling it into the um, ear canal so the entire 360 of the swab is um, coated. And that's also very important when you're getting ear cultures. And then I just roll it repeatedly in, in linear lines on a glass slide using the frosted side up. The optics for glass slides that are um, that have a frosted end, it is meant to put the sample on the frosted side. So if you've ever done cytology and you can't find it or can't focus, and you've got frosted slides, you've put it on the wrong side. Then it is not necessary to flame these slides. As a matter of fact, it's better not to, because flaming them with a match or a lighter um, will damage the cellular um, integrity of the cell, so it makes it kind of crooks them, so it makes it hard to see what they are. And then it adds soot to the bottom of the glass slide, which you can't see. So I don't, I don't uh, do that. It's not necessary to do that. There's studies that back it up to not do that. And then I will put it in, and I use DiffQuick. The most important thing when you're doing your DiffQuick stains is to spend a little bit more time in the blue stain uh, to do that, because the organisms that you're staining have a lot of protein in them, and that's what the blue will pick up is the protein. And then I'll rinse it not in tap water. It's important to use distilled water. If you're having problems with streaking of your slides, it's you know um, that is because you've got uh, you're using tap water. So just use distilled water and let them air dry, and then examine them first at 4x, then at 10x, and then at 100x or oil. I'm done. Thank you. Um, would you see Demodex on the ear slide before you see clinical signs such as hair loss? Yes. Yes, you can. Um, and sometimes these dogs just come in with um, uh, kind of itchy ears, and we find the mites on uh, the ear swabs. And then um, we may look a little bit closer at the dog and then just do a lot more random pluckings. Um, you know, before you see hair loss, you'll oftentimes see red erythema. And so we'll pluck in those areas, and then we'll find Demodex. So yes, that's, that's definitely um, a possibility. So it, it is time and money well spent. Thank you. And we'll take this as our last question, Dr. Moriello. Uh, do you recommend routine cleaning of more than the pinna? Um, more than the pinna. So um, I'm assuming. Um, that it's just the outer pinna, and then we'll, we'll probably the question is asking is, do you want to clean like the pipes under the sink? Um, if you're doing, um, or if, you, if your dog has ear disease, definitely you need to clean the outer, the outside of the pinna, the inner pinna, and the canals. If you have a dog with no ear disease whatsoever, then all you need to do is clean wherever your little washcloth can go um, on the ear and in your finger. You don't need to go ahead and get in any, um, try to get into the vertical canal or the horizontal ear canal. Hopefully that answered that question. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Well, that ends our event tonight. Uh, we want to thank Dr. Moriello and all of you for your time. We invite you to take a few minutes to complete our survey. Your feedback is important to us. Click on the link on your screen. If for some reason you don't see it, it is also in the resource file at the bottom of your screen. 
and the link will be emailed to you in a few days. This webcast will be available on demand shortly, and we hope you'll share this presentation on your social sites. Please take advantage of our free on-demand web webcasts available on our website at www.maddiesinstitute.org and plan to join us this fall for more thought-provoking and exciting webcasts filled with both useful and pra practical information and delivered by the most prominent speakers in animal sheltering and animal medicine, I mean shelter medicine. Thanks again for being here with us this evening and have a wonderful summer.